Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Elliot Keeker. I'm a teaching assistant professor at SILS. I teach mostly in the archive and record management track, as well as classes in academic librarianship. Um, and I had a career in both of those things before coming to SILS. I'm Francesca Tripodi. I'm in the School of Information and Library Science as well. I don't know why I just said that. Obviously, we're at SILS. I study gender and racial inequality on Wikipedia, and I also look at how search engines are manipulated for political gain and the way that we see the world shaping our queries and how that ends up shaping our returns. I am a sociologist, so I call myself a sociologist of search. Great. And hi, everyone. My name is Maggie Mello. I'm an assistant professor here at SILS. And I research how to make welcoming and inclusive STEM learning environments, such as maker spaces in academic libraries. And I'm also the director for the Equity in the Making Lab. So I'm delighted to be here with Elliot and Francesca. And so some context around our conversation today, we're gonna talk about various aspects of academic life, like collaboration, why we do the research we do, what we find most important about teaching, and things about the academy that can be challenging. And so Elliot's gonna start us off. Yeah, I'll start us off. So in thinking about this issue, I was thinking about academic norms because in many ways, academia is like its own subculture. So once we were part of the field, even including as graduate students, I feel like there's norms that we learn about that are traditions, rituals, and things that we um, carry on and do. And a lot of them I love, like, the circulation of information through writing, like I actually find writing as a tool for thinking to be amazing. And some people find it old fashioned, but that's actually something about this field that I love is being able to distill our ideas and circulate them across the world through writing and just having a curiosity about the world and being in a position to actually um, spend your time researching some little aspect of the world of great interest. I feel like I did it in childhood in the unofficial way. And now in the academy, I get to do that. Um, but there's also things in the norms that I think could change. And so one of those that I'll throw out before I hear from you all is that I feel like there's a lot of pressure to have an original and remarkable idea before you publish and circulate things. But actually, I don't think ideas are very original at all. I think that they are something that is collected from things we read, conversations we've had, maybe even if we teach about it as well. And so if I could change something, I would get away from some of that remarkable worthiness of an idea and push people just to circulate interesting ideas, good ideas, things on their mind. So I ask you both, what's a norm that really attracts you to the field and you like carrying on? And maybe what's a norm that you would do away with? Maggie, do you wanna go first? You go ahead. Um, I love this question, Elliot, and I think it got me really thinking about what do I love most and what, what would I change? I think it's just a fabulous way to start off this conversation. Um, I agree with you. I often can't believe my job is my job. So I think the thing that I love most about academia is um, setting my cadence, right? Having the ability to um, determine where I go and when I go and how I'm doing it. Obviously there are constraints when I'm teaching a class, I'm required to be there. But what I feel is very fortunate even about SILS is that I get to decide what classes I wanna teach and <laughs> um, shape classes around those ideas. Uh, engaging in like learning from young people, I think is also something I just really value. I, I feel like, um, I'm always on top of what's happening in the world around me because I can listen and engage with students on a regular basis. And then the ability to kind of go down these rabbit holes like you're talking about. Uh, you know, I think I read this, yeah, it, there's this very fine line between um, imagination and research, right? So it's like, I think I read it as in a children's book, but it was like, if your ideas are all over the place, uh, it's imagination, but if they're numbered, it's scientific inquiry. And I think that I love that we just basically engage in imagination, but in this systematic way, um, that's pretty incredible. Something though that I think we've talked a lot about this too, is like pushing back on this idea that because we set our cadence, 
our cadence has to be full time all the time. And um, something I definitely learned in grad school, largely from my advisors, was this never off button. Um, it was very much encouraged in the classroom, you know. Um, and I think one thing that I'm really learning from my students is the value of that balance. And so I wish we could shift to more of that balance, but a lot of the evaluative mechanisms are still really rooted in that. And I think the other downfall to academic life is the emphasis on critique. And I think that gets back to your idea to Elliot about ideas. So I think the reason why some of us feel like our ideas have to be groundbreaking is that often the critique served back to us is like, how is this new? Why is this adding to whatever? And I find myself doing it too when I'm being an advisor. So, um, you know, this emphasis on critique, I think can be really hard for just breaking the cycle, but also just mental health. That resonates for sure. What, what do you think, Maggie? Yeah, I think that's that's interesting, thinking about Francesca's, Francesca's point about critique. I think growing up as a grad student or through the academic tradition, one of the main things I was taught to do was to critique, right? And I feel like learning that there's almost this knee-jerk reaction to first critique versus trying to understand and recognize the moves that the author is making the argument they're presenting, and then of course, leaving some space for critique as well. And so I'm also kind of unlearning that too and I'm um, talking that through with my students. But in terms of what I enjoy most about being in the academy, and I thought about this question and it continues to circle back to teaching. I love teaching. And I know we're an R1 institution, we're all about research and that's cool too. Not that's cool to like being dismissive, but much of my energy and also my liveliness that comes into my research is from being in a learning community with students. And so being in the classroom, it, I, it's not lost on me that it's a privilege to be in that position to work with a small group of students for 16 weeks, right? Talking about things that frustrates us that we're learning about. And then after 16 weeks, our little community is dissolved. And to me, that seems kind of sad, but also kind of sweet to have that moment in time. In the classroom now, I think more so than ever, it also makes me feel less cynical. Um, the news cycle right now continues to be super heavy. And I will admit I'm feeling pretty jaded and cynical and feeling a little disconnected from humanity in ways that I didn't expect or expect to say in a form like this right now. But I will say, being in the classroom and seeing the ways that students talk to each other, help each other, are compassionate and are empathetic, it reminds me that like humans are cool. And like I think we're going to be OK because these are the people we get to learn with and work along with. So when it comes to what I like most about the Academy, it's hands down teaching. I love teaching. And I hope I continue to do that. What I would change is the predatory publication processes in place. Oh my goodness. The ideas that we get to engage with these research questions, we get to develop these findings, but then we have to quickly, quickly send them out for publication. How are we gonna get them to the communities that matter? How are we gonna translate them to research? Are we gonna pay over $600 to make them open access? There's this constant, obstacles that go along with your research going out there to the community in a way that's meaningful that makes it very frustrating for me. And also, I, okay, I'm gonna stop at this point. The peer review process, I do my best to say yes, because they will request, can you please review these for us? Your um, participation is very important. Without you, you know, it's very heavy and I feel very guilty about it but also that's a lot of labor. I feel like we could do better. This isn't my area of expertise, but it's a norm that I wish we could continue to push change on. That's such a good point, Maggie. I think the peer review process is essential because 
we need to make sure, right, that we're not just all putting, although maybe it's not essential, right, getting back to Elliot's idea too, of that it runs counter to just putting ideas out there. Um, I don't know, we can have it just a separate talk on peer review, but. Uh, okay, so here's the question I thought of. This is getting a little more personal, but I'm, you know, junior faculty, just going up for tenure this year, and I find I'm still struggling with getting out of the graduate student mindset and into the professor mindset. Um, and I know in some ways I'm doing it, it feels good. But I guess I was wondering for you both, um, am I the only one feeling this way? And if it's yes, that's totally fine. But like, or maybe you had this point of peak earlier and you could just provide some guidance. But for those of us, as we go along our trajectories, you know, how do you all deal with, and I guess this is kind of just wrapped up with the ideas of imposter syndrome, right? But like, how do we deal with this balance between being in that very vulnerable place of grad school? Because grad school is a very, very vulnerable place where all people are doing is <laughs> critiquing your ideas and you just have to defend them over and over and over again to a place where now we're the ones critiquing, but do we even want to do it that way? Anyways, I'm rambling, but that is my thing I would love to hear from you both. Elliot, what do you think? Well, I think one of the things that Francesca said that resonated was that graduate school is like this weird temporality of vulnerability, like Francesca's saying, where like you feel like you're constantly being critiqued and judged and looking forward to this opportunity to compete for a job having no idea if you'll be successful and unfortunately a lot of people aren't successful and it's not their fault it's because there's not many jobs right <clears throat> but i wonder if that temporal feeling then goes into this pre-tenure determination as well like francesca saying feeling like even the notion of being a junior faculty <laughs> it's kind of an odd um term um it makes you feel yet again vulnerable so even though you made it and you got the job the judgments are still coming and there's still demonstration of your success that you have to keep proving through publishing and service and other you know, teaching quality classes and things like that. So I can totally see that ethos of graduate studentism carrying on because you're still proving yourself. Um, but one thing that I've found that makes me remember and feel really different is moving from a mentee into into a mentor. Um, you know, like I think a lot of my teachers I had in graduate school and even as undergrads were mentors to me. Some of them were, and I built relationships and I would still consider them that. Like if I wanted some advice, there's people that I'm like, I would love to ask them what they think and like I need to ask them. Um, but now I realize I'm that person for some students. And to me, that's an internal marker of a kind of professional success mm -hmm. and a kind of graduated thing that at least I have enough experience to mentor, <laughs> you know, and so you're still a mentee and then you also gain another identity as a mentor is something that I see in there. And what do you think, Maggie? I was thinking along the same lines. I, I feel like, Francesca, I empathize with you to have those feelings of, um, imposter syndrome and the way that I cope with it and maybe it's not a healthy way so I'm gonna you know your mileage may vary people but sometimes instead of imposter syndrome I feel like I'm kind of getting away with something instead that I feel like huh I fooled them yet again and I don't feel bad about it but instead I feel like I'm gonna keep this going I'm gonna keep this performance going so I don't know if that's healthy but that's it's kind of the same token of feeling like I don't know if I'm supposed to be here for for certain reasons but in terms of feeling like a student, I feel like that all the time. And I don't necessarily think that it's a bad thing um, in the sense that I can provide guidance and support and ex expertise to a student only to a certain amount. And then I know that they surpass me in their level of understanding. Like for example, one of my PhD students, Rachel, she's doing UX design and foster care in North Carolina. 
And there came a point where I'm like helping her around the methods and some of the content. But now she's reaching a point where she knows more than me about this stuff, right? And now I am the student and I can provide guidance and other things, but I've learned that I can't know everything. But I know I could support her. I could ask the questions and, you know, make those connections for her. But I feel okay about that, too. So. I love that. I want to summarize what I heard from both of you, because I think it's important. So from what I heard from both of you is embracing that element of mentorship. And through that, finding those internal markers of, like, seeing yourself in that space, as well as, um leaning into the graduate student doesn't die kind of mentality of like being open to learning and recognizing that through good mentorship, your students will learn more than you have now. And you can, and it can be like two ways. So that was super awesome. Y'all, I love you both. <laughs> Francesca, we have, we're only halfway there and you had two questions. Did you want to ask the other one? We can come back to we can come back to mine if we need. Let's. I want to make space for all of our questions first, and then we can come sure. back. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it does relate to it. It's about time management. Maggie, let's go there then. Right. So, how do we measure our time? You know, I mean, uh, we're halfway through this. this. is a great way to say. But like, I. Uh, what are some strategies that you have for mentoring your time? Um, really, a really amazing. You know, person at CTAP, um, Shannon Malone Gonzalez mentioned at a recent uh, seminar with us that she schedules writing time on her calendar. That's one way that she does it really well. Um, she figures out someone internally to help her navigate what she can say no to versus what she can't. Because I think there's this like big ethos, like say no, but then. Uh, there's some things you can't say no to and you need somebody higher up in your space in your place to be like no that was a, a courtesy ask yes that's right um, but what are some of the things that you all can share in terms of managing time elliot well i don't know if i have it down but one thing that always resonated with me was someone telling me that it's not about not having enough time it's about not prioritizing. And so someone once told me like, I stopped saying like, I didn't have time to do that and started shifting to, I didn't prioritize time to do that. And I was like, that's a really good, it's a, it's a language shift, but also a mentality shift. And so for me, I always try to prioritize some of the things I really love to do. So it could be that like some sort of thing I'm researching and I really love reading about that or writing about that or something, it's giving me excitement at that moment. So I make sure I do have time because if anything else happens, at least I did that thing that was super important. And another thing that I really prioritize is being prepared for the classroom. I like to <clears throat> sometimes prepare lectures and hands-on activities. And all of that does require more than the morning of. It requires you know, making sure I gather myself, my readings, my notes, um, and so that's something that I feel like each week I prioritize that on my schedule. Um, the other thing is setting myself up not to feel a sense of lost time. Sometimes meetings and doing things with people can feel like lost time because there's not like a lot of production that happens afterward. But I have tried to rewrite that in myself and think of it as time spent with another person like a sense of community with the students that I'm meeting with or with the other faculty who I maybe don't know. And when I rewrite that, it feels really different. And I'm like, a person needs to spend time with others. It doesn't matter if there's not like a thing that came from it. Like I did something that's a really worthy use of my time. So I guess those are more theoretical answers, but that's where my mind goes. <laughs> what are you thinking, Maggie? Uh, I, so there's FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. And I think what you're describing is JOMO, the joy of missing out. <laughs> um, and I think what's so helpful about your framing, Elliot, is that you already have your own set of values and principles that guide how you're going to manage your time. Because like you said, if you don't, someone else will manage it for you. And so the thought of like, all right, well, I'm not going to do this, but that means that I get to like build community with someone or spend time with them 
even though you're right, there's not a deliverable that comes out of it, right? We didn't create a paragraph on Google Docs to move our publication forward, but there's something still just as valuable. And I like use valuable, but important about having that relationship. Um, time management, work-life balance. I think it's all, it's a sham people. Um, one book that I'm reading right now that is putting things in perspective for me is Time Management for Mortals. I don't know if y'all heard of it, um, but the book premise is really just kind of taking down ideas around productivity and time management and really putting it in the framework of how finite our time here is on earth, right? And so when thinking about it, one of the anecdotes was this idea of juggling. You could juggle all certain types of like, let's say balls, right? Some of them are glass, some of them are rubber. If you drop some that are glass, those are breakable and you're not able to have them in the air again. So in that case, if I'm juggling things right now today, I'm like, okay, Elliot's birthday is coming up, but I really got to get this chapter in. Uh, maybe he'll forgive me. No, it's like, how do you prioritize it? What things are going to break? What things can bounce back? Or I got invited to do a talk. I really want to do it. Perhaps if they don't ask me again, you just hope in the future, all right, I'm going to say no, something else will come up. They always do come up. So I guess the bottom line for me is it's, it's difficult, but I think as Elliot was talking about, having a framework is helpful to bring peace with making those decisions. I just ordered that book. <laughs> it, it's good. It's good and it does that memento mori, this kind of thought about like, oh yeah, I'm going to die, but not in a morbid way. Um, I think in a helpful way. There's a quote in a Mary Oliver poem that's like, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? And I think about that sometimes because then I'm like, sitting here talking to this person was totally worth my like precious little life. Reading this book I love is totally worth my precious little life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Did you have a um, also a question, Maggie, that you had written? I did. In the few minutes that we have left, I guess just to, I guess, tie the themes that we've been discussing so far, how do you go about selecting research topics or questions that you want to investigate and what factors influence your choices? Yeah. <laughs> You want me to start? Okay. Yeah, I'm just. Hey, um, I love this question, Maggie. Uh, mo most of my research is just driven by my passions, right? So what, um, which is again circles back to Elliot's first question: why this job is so amazing. But also, I don't like when the ideas that I put forth are critiqued harshly, and I find I double and triple down on research that is often initially pushed back on as, is this valuable? How is this sociology was a question I got a lot. Or um, maybe for my Wikipedia work, maybe these women aren't notable and that's why they're getting deleted. And it, and it creates this fire that then often drives the work that I'm doing. Um, but oh yeah, and I think that's actually why we all really love each other because we I think this is a common thread among us, but I don't want to speak for you too. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Francesca. I don't think usually about like what needs to be done at large or like sometimes you're taught that ethos of like, where's the holes in the research, which has never resonated with me because I don't really believe in that whole notion, but also why would I just want to fill a gap? <laughs> um, I more so like, like what, if I'm going to spend time doing it, kind of re relating to Francesca's other question, what really resonates with me. And often I think about it of like, what pattern can I put together really well that maybe like other people haven't quite woven that pattern. And it's because of the stuff I was reading and the stuff I was doing. And usually for me, it's applying some idea from one discipline into a new context. And I find that that's usually my route to starting research. So Elliot, would you say it's pretty interdisciplinary the way that you approach it? Definitely, because I still 
I still really resonate with the things I learned in literary theory when <clears throat> I got my first master's degree in English. And I know that that's what resonates in my heart methodologically because I still use those theorists and those ideas like close reading is one of my main methods, document analysis as a main method. I learned that from literary scholars, but now I don't study literature. I might study something at large in the world with information studies or something like that. And so um, I guess that's where my like little niche is, is applying that literary studies somewhere else. What about you? Yeah, that's funny because I'm also an English major too. <laughs> and there are many times that I will say rhetorical analysis in class and people are all like, wait a minute, there's your rhetoric showing. Um, but Francesca <laughs> said that passion drives her research. I think for me, at least in the beginning, it was frustration, indignation, <laughs> and anger. And um, as Audre Lorde mentions, like anger has a clarifying way of revealing some type of purpose, right? And I think working in a maker space early on, I was really frustrated with how this environment was gatekept, right? Only certain people who have certain expertise could be in this space, but the space has so much potential to be transformative. Like for example, in class, in my makerspace class, I taught students how to make paper circuits. <laughs> and it literally, you watch their face light up putting copper tape, LEDs and batteries together. And one of my students, he said, I showed this to my nephews and they thought I was a genius. <laughs> and I said, and that's the reason why I do this research. It's because when we learn how to make things, the world looks different. We see ourselves as these participants and not only these consumers and that we could change the world in ways that we could create things. And I think that's super powerful. So I feel like I've shifted from indignation and anger to more of like joy and being in community with things that we create. I think that is how we end this conversation. That was like phenomenal. I love that. Um, do you have anything else you all want to add before we, or is this, are we ended at 12 30 or do we keep going? I think we're done. we don't take questions, right? I think that's, yeah. Yeah, our, yeah, I don't know if there were questions, but um, I love being in conversation with you both on a regular basis. I hope yeah. you know, per usual. Likewise. And thanks everyone for joining too. Yeah, it's great to see you. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye, Bye. everyone.